Heads, and welcome to the League, exploring the League of Legends lore from A to Z. My name is Rebecca. And I'm John. And I'm Mark. And today we are talking about the Emperor of the Sands, Azir, who was released September 16th, 2014. He doesn't feel old. He feels pretty new right. in the game anyway. Maybe it's because right. he's hard to play. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I've just played him so little that he might as well have been released yesterday. Yeah, Mark, I think you only picked him up kind of recently, so maybe that's why he feels super new to you. Yeah, it's nice. It's like when you don't buy video games, and then you just wait for them to be $5, and it's like, ah, <laughs> this is all new. This is great. And that's a zero, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for joining us. Uh, so on his universe page, Azir has a bio, four short stories, kind of, and for some reason, his login music video noticeably missing it's cool from <laughs> that page are the two cinematics that are literally about him and another short story which i can see why they left it off but because it was part of a uh, special compilation of stories and history and art from a special what was it called tales of rune terra book that they released for their 10th realms anniversary of rune terra. realms of rune terra which is a special book that is sold separately. <laughs> sold separately, yeah. You gotta get the full Azir action kit, Excuse man. me, I thought, I thought League of Legends wasn't pay to win. What the hell is this? <laughs> you can't win unless you know all about Azir and his karate chop action arm. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, who wants to do the bio? Do you want to rock the bio, and then I will rock the water and shade short story and a fun thought experiment from a Necrit video? Okay, yeah, sure. I, I, <laughs> I, I watched any Necrit for, for this. So, uh, yeah, sure. And I, I think, like you said, Rebecca, he has a bunch of other stories. He's got a Risen. Risen's really short. I can even do a Risen if, or, or John if you want to. But the others, even though they're linked to him, don't have a lot to do with him, and we can kind of just pick out the little the little pieces that are relevant for him i think yeah okay so the the bio i i thought okay I'll, I'll preface this by saying was this not like a really fucking long bio was this not mm -hmm. way longer than any of the others it seemed way longer and i don't even know if it was necessarily way longer or whether all of its length was just chock full of shit like there was just so much in this bio yeah, yeah. Um, I, I guess that's my first complaint. Um, I think it's, it's <laughs> way too much. Uh, but we can, I'll, I'll, we'll go through it. Um, so it starts in ancient Shrima. Uh, we talked about them before, but they're a big empire. They have vassal states, and they use the Ascended as their their ace in the hole, like the thing that they use to dominate other surrounding nations. And Azir is the youngest son of the royal family. It says that he's the least favored, but I don't think it ever makes a really good case for why. It just kind of sets him that way. I think it was because the he preferred books over combat, and his dad very much seemed to not be a fan of that. See, I read it as I might have to actually go check the text, and I maybe I will. But I read it as because he was the last son, and he was just never ever expected to ever rule. He just kind of became a bookworm. He was destined for being a scholar or a priest, and so it just kind of lent himself naturally. Like, oh, who cares about going and do training with Renekton? I'll go to the library of Nasus or Nasus. Sorry. Uh, yeah, and because he's so lanky, no one like that wants to do combat. Those gangly people, they yeah. love their libraries. Yeah, it was probably a, a combination of things. I imagine him being so far down the line, his dad just, like, didn't really care. I mean, his dad seemed like a real dick. So sure. a son being so far down the line is would be deemed unimportant is kind of... I'm, I'm fine with unimportant or just, I guess, like, least favored. You could read a different a, a, a couple different ways. We'll, we'll, we'll come back to it because I think it's it's a problem with the writing. One of many problems. <laughs> I, I agree. And he's also, <clears throat> by the end of the bio, my least favorite. So... <laughs> I kind of unfortunately agree. Uh, okay, so let's continue. We're going to get hung up. It's a lot. We'll, we'll go through it. So I know. while he's there, he meets a slave boy. Um, I guess it's important to, to emphasize that Shirima has a really massive slave population. They leverage it like across the empire. Um, I think obviously pulling from those conquered nations. And he meets a slave boy there kind of regularly, and they become friends. Uh, it's a mention that slaves aren't allowed to have names, but Azir kind of breaks the law and kind of secretly between them gives them the name of Zareth. A name that we should all be familiar with. Uh, 
but it means one who shares. And he eventually kind of twists it so that Zareth ends up being his his personal slave. So at the very least, they're together. And and for now, they're they're kids and they're friends. Uh, now, while they're touring around, Azir and his family get attacked by assassins, and Zareth saves Azir's life. And Azir, you know, wants to reward Zareth, but his dad just doesn't give a shit about him because he's a slave. Also, while this happens, Azir's all of his other brothers are slain. So now Azir is next in line to be the emperor. And this, I think Azir is about 15 at this point, it says, when his dad, this, the current emperor, starts and out like kind of purging the ranks, I guess you would say, trying to find all the assassins who kill his family. And it kind of frames it as Azir is in a very precarious position where, you know, the queen could still give birth to a healthy son. And when that happens, Azir is on the chopping block. This yes. is part of why I think that, that, that that's an issue with the ride, that, that least favorite thing. It tips the hand way too early, and it's not... Cl- it, it'd be fine if you said... Sorry, I'm going to editorialize a bit no, here. No, it'd be yeah. fine if you said, um, you know, as a... Because re- it does say that, oh, because he survived, and he, you know he was the last son, and no one had given a shit about him, his dad grew to kind of resent him. And I think that's fine to introduce it then. But having it be the case that he's already... Again, I guess if you want to read least favorite, it's just like the least popular, maybe, but it reads very much as like, oh, just no one likes his ear. So now yeah, he's in this really dangerous position. The problem is that his dad hates him so much that he's trying to have another baby to make just that so baby. Just so kill him. Yeah, so like, yes, what the it fuck feels does Azir do? Yeah, it, it feels very I'm, silly. Azir's a fucking nerd. That's, that's what. That's a lot of work. Is. So, and, I, I definitely, and we talked about how there's too much in the bio, but I need more in this instance. I need to know why does his dad fucking hate him so much that he's willing to kill yeah. him and make a baby the heir? <laughs> like, yeah, it's it's bizarre. It's really bizarre. Um, well, I, I, I have I have my beliefs about it, but let's get through this, sure. I guess. So, over time, the 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 queen uh, does get pregnant, but none of them come to term. Um, and it's kind of rumored that the Azir might be involved in that, causing some sort of curse. And he actually executes a few people who accuse him of it. So the queen does eventually bear a healthy son. Uh, I don't know if it's the night of the birth or sometime immediately after. But and a natural storm shows up and starts striking the palace repeatedly, repeatedly with lightning. And the the son and the queen both die in the blaze, as well as the emperor. It's some people seem to suggest that he had killed himself in his grief. Other people said that him and his guards were all found in the room, you know, burnt to charred pieces. So regardless, Azir is now the emperor. So while Azir is the emperor, he talks about him continuing to expand the nation's borders, um, putting in, uh, (laughs) implementing things to improve the lives of slaves, like reforms, I guess we might suppose. And he secretly internally commits to eventually freeing them. Uh, and does not tell Zareth for reasons. I cannot stress. I have no <laughs> idea because it's heavily emphasized that they are they're like this. I, I'm doing the fingers crossed motion. It, <laughs> they are like they're like brothers essentially. They're adopted brothers, and they're supposed to be the closest friends. And it makes no sense to me no sense. why Zareth is not informed. Now I can give some rough. I mean, obviously it's I, I it's bad, but <laughs> I will say the. The reason it's at least a secret from people other than Zareth is because obviously like a big part of I, it seems like their infrastructure is built on slave labor and they know that the rich people in Sharim are going to be real pissed off when this all happens. Um, that being said, obviously like Zareth is not everyone else. It's kind of implied that he wouldn't have told him. Uh, I guess in the in the bloodline story, Nasus does specifically say at one point secrets in Sharima never get kept or like don't like being kept which again it's just kind of a throwaway line to justify a poor decision <laughs> but yes. I know why I know why the writer did it it's because spoiler alert so the, the story can happen exactly it, it's so because they yes. wanted to write that betrayal the li- literally yes. the only reason it's kept from Zareth is so Zareth could portray Azir the only reason Absolutely. I, I, that's that's really my big issue with the bio. I've got another very significant complaint that we'll get to, um, but that's my biggest issue is it feels utterly contrived that they very much wanted to create this tragedy as a result of this relationship, but the, it's not been earned at all. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it falls very flat on its face in a way that it, it's it's silly. It's silly. We're sitting here picking it apart. I'm not even, I'm like halfway through the fucking bio. Yeah, well, you're almost it's, done. You're almost done. <laughs> no, yeah. Um, I guess what, John, you do raise a good point is that that's why Azir... This is another problem. Why Azir says, ostensibly, he's not freeing the slaves immediately. And obviously, this starts to create a rift between him and Zareth, where Zareth 
being a slave is like, hey, what about those campaign promises, my man? And as here, it, it's it, 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 there's no there's nothing clear as to what went on in those conversations. Um, there's a little bit in Zareth's bio where it's mentioned that there's a very explicit moment where Azir says to Zareth, "You need to watch, like essentially, you need to watch your tone. You are a slave," and it it only makes him seem worse. By the way, it doesn't address it all. Still, it, it runs super contrary to how he's depicted here. Anyway, <laughs> so Zareth continues to aid Azir. Um, Another reason that makes no sense as to why Azir doesn't get told is because Zareth is out going out and collecting information and knowledge, just general knowledge for like at Azir's behest. So he's going out and finding all these secrets, um, and he is kind of pushing Azir to say, "Hey, you need to undergo the Ascension ritual, which normally uh, is only reserved for people who have served Tarima their entire life. They're on death's door, and you are selected by the Sun Priests. Again, more priests." But this time it's the Emperor kind of bullying his way in and actually threatening them upon pain of death to make them do the Sun Ascension ritual. So, You know, like the good guys do. Right, right. <laughs> like, I'm fine with Azir being a villain. I just, I want to be written well, man. That's all I care about. Mm -hmm. So the day of the Ascension, Nasus and Renekton are noticeably absent from a, a task by Zareth. No For reason reasons. whatsoever. Yeah. It's unrelated. Zareth has some shit that they need to go take care of. Uh, and right before the ascension, right as Azir is about to go step into the light of the sun, he turns to Zareth and he says, hey, man, I'm doing it. You're free. The slaves of Shirim are free. Ascension 2020, baby. And he steps <laughs> in and Azir and Zareth blasts him with his magic. Z Zareth kind of at this point decides to do his betrayal, uh, blasts Azir with his magic, causes Azir to just be consumed by the sun and essentially killed. And Zareth steps in to take the ascension instead. And as a result of that, this is also not clear, because it's stolen or based on a betrayal, for some reason, it causes the Ascension to backfire and just fuck up the entire city. Kills everyone, including all of Azir's family, sinks the city in the dust. And, and as a result of that, the Empire eventually you know, crumbles and whatever. So that's the case for, like, millennia, we would probably say. Ancient Shrimas, dead and buried. Fast forward to Azir floating in a timeless oblivion when all of a sudden he is brought back when the blood of one of his descendants... How he has a descendant. He has we a don't know. Yes, that's... <laughs> I, we'll talk about that in, in a second. <laughs> um, it's not clear why, it's res why it resurrects him, what happens, but you know his descendant, spoiler, Sivir, gets betrayed while plunging the tomb, bleeds out onto the floor and causes him to come back. He takes her to the Oasis of the Dawn, which is this dried up oasis at the base of the city, I guess, and it starts flowing again. He rests her in the waters, causes her to heal, and because of this act of selfless, selflessness, Azir's ascension ritual kind of like triggers, and it's like, okay, you've earned it. Here you go. And he becomes the ascended Azir. Um, gains control over the sands, raises up the sun disk, which was, we talked about the sun disk before, super big thing, and Shirima had fallen when Azir's shit fucked up. Now it's back up. <laughs> the city's back. Shirima's back, baby. And that's where hey. we end the bio. And here's where I pause real quick to say there was a very specific <laughs> line that I have not mentioned from this bio. Oh, boy. I think steps into a realm that is too dark for League lore. So just a heads up, I would say, as we step into this discussion. Uh, we get a little insight into Azir's sexual proclivities, where not only do we hear that he, he fucks his wife, no harm, no foul. He has a harem as well. Okay. But that he also has sex with slave girls. Which is rape. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Does that not seem way, way beyond what we should... is like in the bounds to discuss when we talk about fucking League of Legends lore? Yes. Yeah, is I that mean, just like, me? you could have left it at a harem, dude. Yeah, yeah, sure. I, yeah. I would have been absolutely <laughs> serves, fine with that. Yeah. I would say even... You know what? It, that's my other big complaint, is that it just feels unnecessary and, like, it bad writing. It poisons, I would say, Azir for me to a degree. I like... I was, I was really enjoying playing Azir recently, man. <laughs> It's like fuck, but yeah, I would say even better. Give him a named mistress. Give him. Give. Let's give. Let's have a character or something so that maybe it means something a bit more, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And maybe it could explain why he has a descendant that wasn't in Shirima, because there's no reason for him to have a descendant, right? They all died. His family died. Uh, I would assume yeah. everyone's in Shirima. But so, how does he have a living descendant? If he had a mistress elsewhere, it would make sense that he was able to have a living descendant. It brings a lot more, yeah. just everything to the story. And also, the way slavery is handled in general in this story is horrendous. But yeah, you can't have a consensual relationship with your slave. That is not possible. Yeah, and like yeah. even if 
even if the goal was to just like, oh, well, we'll put this in because we want it to be clear that he's the bad guy. Like, you already made it clear. You don't need this too. Like, it was yeah. an unnecessary layer. <laughs> I, I yeah. completely agree. And I would say even worse is that Azir is often not framed as a bad guy. He's not characterized as the bad guy. He's yeah. characterized as someone who has made mistakes and is poised for a redemption arc. Zareth is portrayed as a bad guy. And I'm not saying he's good. He supposedly caused at least like a couple miscarriages. But it's it, it feels... Oh, my God. It's it's hard to unravel. I feel like we're entering this this issue of like fractal bad writing where we just got to unla- un, like layer after layer after layer to... to talk about why this is, is shitty right yeah yeah i started getting mad um because I, I feel like i mean we can agree that zara's anger is justifiable he literally like nearly got killed as a boy trying to save azir's life and then and then helped him gain power and then also still wasn't freed for reasons tm 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 that we don't know so I, 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 and I don't like that this entire city is destroyed because a slave wanted freedom. And, and I think that's really messed up. And I think that part of the reason why the writer had Azir turn around and be like, guess what, bud, you're free right before Zareth betrayed him is because he didn't want that. Whoever the writer was didn't want that association, I guess, that like, oh, well, see, now Zareth's not a slave anymore. So he wasn't trying to get freedom. I don't know. That yeah. just didn't sit well with me. I, I, I think the goal, I, if I had to suppose as to author intention, I would as- assume that the goal is just to try and create a, almost a, a gift of the magi type tragedy mm-hmm. where, oh, you know, there was once a time where we could have been, we could have seen this t- through to a way that made everything good, but we both got caught up in our own things and it's gone bad. But it's really hard to, like, I mean, like you said, it's it's really hard to find a lot of fault with Zareth's position and if we had gotten at the very least if we had gotten something that was really strong in terms of this is why I can't do this for you you know if it would cause a massive civil war I think you could try and if you wanted to try and fix this you could start looking at the ascension as being this is the key because now I'll be ascended and I'll be the like the most powerful ascended and we can force this and it doesn't matter what the the slave leveraging family say we're gonna you know we've got the power to do it we've got the leverage to do it it's it's if you wanted to start trying to fix this but that's us Trying to fucking fill holes, man. Yeah. What we got is, is is Swiss fucking cheese. Yeah, it was it was not good. And and his, I mean, I, like Azir's reasoning for delaying setting the slaves free is it's going to cause a civil war. It's worth a civil war. Like if you need, <laughs> I was gonna to, say we did fight yeah, one. Yeah, you like you need to get rid of slavery in your society. You have a failed society if you're relying on slaves. So it's yeah. When I say civil war, I guess I just mean like some an un, an unwinnable war would be what I say. Where they need something that oh something like for sure we can't do it now. It, it, I, I, mean, <laughs> I mean, like I said, this is just me off the top of my head trying to fix yeah, it a little. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. On the other hand, too, like. They already had, like, it's not like Azir was the first Ascended. Like, they already had yeah. an army of Ascended on their side that yeah. were kind of honor-bound to follow whatever Azir said. Like, if there was any sort of, like, insurrection after he freed the slaves, like, he has an army of fucking Ascended to be like, no, nah, put him down. Mm-hmm. Like, he didn't need to be one himself to do it. <laughs> yeah. It's a fair question. Yeah. You know, it's... I, I will say with that, you know, we that would be something to... That's something where I wish we could get more insight into that relationship towards those last years of the Empire. Because when we look at one of the Link stories, Twilight of the Gods, we see the very kind of the last days of the Ascended as they're becoming the Darken. And I thought that was a, it's a really good story, by the way. That one's well written. Um, and it's also <laughs> very interesting to see how they are. It's affecting their mental state because you're immortals who've been turned into ageless killing machines. And they're starting to just become insane and deg- degrade. So if you wanted to try and suppose that Ascended would not follow him. That would be something to, again, ways you could potentially start propping up this I- this idea, but it's not supported at all, and that's the real problem, right? Is that it's just there to create to facilitate the tragedy, right? Yeah, and this actually this ties a little bit to the the Necrit theory that we'll talk about a little bit later. Okay. Okay, interesting. That that does make me curious. I have a lot more complaints about the bio though before we. Get oh to yeah, yeah, let's go. No let's do it. Um, I think that there's an issue with again just going back to the idea of, of Azir not freeing the slaves I think it causes an, an inversion of the characterizations between him and Zareth 
the, the, the thing we get a lot about Azir is that he's supposed to be very full of hubris, very proud, very headstrong. And Zareth is very calculating and very aware of the tactical situation and things at large. And he's kind of, you know, he knows what's, he's in the know, whereas Azir is kind of blind to what's around him. It seems like if anyone was going to be like, okay, we're freeing the slaves right now, it would maybe be Azir. And, 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 and you know, Zareth might, would be the one to say, hey, check yourself. You, you aren't going to win this if you try and do this. But obviously they can't have that because it, it doesn't facilitate the tragedy they're trying to create, right? Yeah, I couldn't get on... As your side, I, I wish that they really leaned into just the fact l- that he's a villain. Because he is a villain. Like, it, he keeps saying that he loves Zareth. This is his brother. How could you just keep your brother as a slave? And <laughs> You know what I mean? Like, it's just... Unless they lost a bet or something, and then they have to be your slave for a day. <laughs> bring whatever you put into <laughs> a not... cup, but, you know. Yeah, it, it no, doesn't, yeah, I... doesn't fit. I, I, I completely agree. Um, and it, it's really a shame, because it, it does kind of... Like I said, it kind of poisons the character in anything that kind of features him. And it's really hard to try and handle this characterization of him as a on, on, on a, some sort of hero's journey and Zareth as, especially in, in the Bloodline story, as, as some like a comic book villain, right? Like you, in that story, there's not a lot of Zareth in Bloodline, um, but you do have a depiction of Zareth. And he's like lording over Nasus and taunting him about how he tortured his brother to insanity. And it's so far away from anything it's 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 like how did his, how did Zareth get here because he started as like this sweet boy who you know he risked his life for his best friend and was a really good person and all he wanted was freedom is what it sounded like so how did he get to a point where he's that help stupidly villainous <laughs> I mean John did you look much into the, I looked at the Zareth bio because I was so curious and they're so intertwined that I, I felt like I needed to kind of dig into Zareth some I haven't reread it in a little while. I know that he did have some kind of darker ambitions even even a little bit earlier on, but I also know that like same as same as Renekton, like they were trapped in like a, a pitch black cave for like what was it, thousands of years, they said. From a Renekton perspective, you're confined with someone whose sole job is to try and make you insane and in Zareth's case it was being confined with someone whose sole job was trying to kill you so i could see how a thousand years would make someone cartoonishly villainous i would be fine if he did not enter that tomb as cartoonishly villain but he the fact that he's like mentally torturing renekton at the outset uh, to me it's, it just it it reads very much and i think the way it's the way i found it depicted as well was that it's it's always kind of cat- characterizing him as villainous, as having being very evil in general in a very black and white way um, that doesn't line up with what they're trying to do in in this relationship between him and Azir. So him going into that tomb already being that way, I think uh, it doesn't it doesn't line up to me. I, I Renekton going insane, sure, I totally you know makes sense, but with Zareth, it feels like he went in bad, and it's only just heightened his. He only seems to be happier. He's cackling all the time. He fucking loves it at this point. Like, who knows? But yeah, uh, it, yeah, I, I I don't like it. <laughs> it's <laughs> and, not good. And there's a lot of it. Yeah, that's the other thing. Is it's so long. <laughs> yeah, there is there is so much of it, and especially because I mean these stories came out right when they were. This was kind of in the prime lore relaunch time where they had they were reimagining the entire world of of rune terra so i know that this was associated with an entire like shuriman event they redid all this lore all at once everyone kind of got their lores updated here so um it came with a lot of uh connected stories yeah that's true and i remember actually when i was rereading that bloodline story i think i mentioned to y'all i remember reading this when it first came out um it was just yeah. kind of funny visiting some of the stuff that it's been so long. Um, it, it, it's, it's true. It's a fair point. It's a good context to kind of have when, when when perceiving it that way. And I'm fine with long bios if they're at least, even if it was kind of boring or not well written. I, I just think that it handles a lot of, it has a lot of mature and heavy subjects, let's say. And you, you've got to hand, have a lot more depth and nuance if you're going to start handling these things. You yeah. Know? You need some, you need a, a few more readers than yeah. he seems to <laughs> <That's> have. <laughs> Yeah, it's like, what were they thinking, man? <laughs> yeah. There's a few other things in here that I thought just also feel like complete hand waves. Like, why is it that Azir gets revived? 
Um, yeah, yeah, why the hell is he ascended? Yeah, they they have a real low bar for selflessness. Right? right? He he helped <laughs> he didn't one of sacrifice his anything. descendants. He helped one of his descendants even. They, they yeah. Wasn't even like, like a stranger. Maybe if he if he helped like Zareth's family, yeah. like that would have been a sacrifice or something. But as we're gonna see in the other short story, that's the furthest thing from what is oh, gonna fucking great. happen. Great, <laughs> great. It's so funny and fresh that you said that. That is great. <laughs> You fucking serious? Uh, Who wrote this shit? Oh, man. Yeah, so no idea. It was definitely like a, oh, instead of focusing on his ambitions, instead of focusing on rebuilding, he decided to help this lady. Like, what? It took like 10 minutes, and he still raises the city immediately afterwards. Yeah. Like, what? Yeah. He didn't yeah. sacrifice anything. <laughs> it was a quick detour. <laughs> <laughs> He stopped at the way. gas station on the way to the grocery store, like <laughs> he needed some and got ascended because yeah. of it. <laughs> oh man, you're doing my boy's ear dirty. I feel so fucking bad. It was really bad, and you can't even blame this on it being really old. I mean, they redid it recently, and I don't know. They've shown that they can have complicated stories with a lot of nuance and a lot of gray areas. We just did it with Ash and Sejuani. So to go from that to this, real kick in the face, you know? Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of, like, hand-waving, especially for the magic around Shirima and, and the Ascension. Because yeah. my understanding, too, was that when the Ascension went wrong, wasn't the disc, like, destroyed, basically? Like, it didn't just fall out of the sky. Like, it didn't, it, like, l either lose its magic or get destroyed? It, I'm sure it lost its magic, I would assume. I'd have to reread that. It, the thing is, it's always kind of just vague in these very large-scale apocalyptic yeah. terms or in ways that are non-specific. Like, I'm sure it says it, it fell, but what that means... You would assume that it would fall into pieces, right? It's just so large, and it's made of it's made of gold or some shit, right? Yeah, solid gold. <laughs> yeah, that shit would just be pa pancake. Yeah, you, you would assume if it had lost its magic and is no longer able to suspend itself in the air which it did with magic. Where's it getting this magic to ascend him in the first place? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess we could just chalk this all up to being what we know about Ascension, which is that it's the Targonian, it's Aurelian soul's power, and, and that's just enough, right? He's a big power fuck-off dragon, so it's it's cool. You know, who knows? But Space magic. It would be kind of fun if Aurelian soul resurrected him to, like, troll him in some way. Sure. Yeah. I, I, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> He also thinks Azir is a piece of shit because he is. <laughs> I mean, and Azir's goal, technically, like, Azir's goal was to just be emperor of Rune Terra. Like, he was going to continue yeah. expanding the borders until he was emperor of everything. And I mean, yeah. he's back with the sole purpose of rebuilding his emperor. Like, obviously, he is not a threat like Aurelian soul is a threat. But... If goal is accomplished, he also plans to <laughs> just take over the world. So yeah. while he is a uh, a C tier villain in the grand scheme of things, we can add him to uh, at least attempted existential threats to Rune Terra. <laughs> I mean, you know, I'm I'm fine leaving him as C tier. Uh, I'm fine with a regional level threat that Azir sits at. Um, you're completely right that I, I'm again. I'm I'm fine with Azir being a villain, and I'm fine with both him and Zir. Well. If you did it right, maybe him and Zareth both just kind of being villains and, uh, you know, whatever. But I think my issue is out both kind of in this and then more in some of the other stories. He definitely, I feel, gets characterized, like I said, as a, a potential heroic figure. Somebody who has made mistakes and who is on a path to, I don't want to say self-improvement per se, but, is, you know, a better path, right? Um, whereas Zareth is just, you know, he's a big evil villain. And I think it's they're both kind of... Shitty. Yeah. Yeah, so this is what you were swearing about, Mark. I got a text from your wife, Sarah, my best friend, <laughs> who's like, Mark's real angry about this lore. <laughs> He's cursing a lot. <laughs> I mean, I, I I guess I would say this is one of my more emotional reactions to League lore, because it, 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 <laughs> it just felt so... And, I mean, this is obviously in reference to, the, to that specific line. It just felt so bizarre at the end of the day it was so bizarre and out of left field and i didn't my best guess is that it's just the writer trying to make sure that we we know there's other descendants but it felt so unnecessary and it you know it's like man it, 
I, I felt like I had a little emotional roller coaster because, like I said, I've been playing a lot of Azir, and I think I was, for the first time in a long time, sitting in that place of, I really like this champion. I want to go learn their lore, and it maybe he and I knew he was already kind of like he's an emperor. He's trying like empires exist to conquer. It's I was fine with him being a villain in that way, and this was just so like, man, come on, what the fuck, dude. Yeah, but yes, this is what I was swearing about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they really fucked him up. It's a shame because I actually the beginning of the bio I was enjoying it even when you're learning about him as a boy. I thought he was kind of endearing, yeah. and it got ruined real quick. Yeah, yeah. And I guess, so to touch on the bloodline bit a bit, or like him having a descendant, like I, I think there is kind of a, a reasonable thing, and you can correct me if I if I misunderstood anything that they talked about here, Mark, because I think you've, you've read a bit more of the bloodline than I did, but it sounded like um, Sivir's descendant... Um, you mean ancestors? Or ancestors, <laughs> Sivir's ancestors, <laughs> were specifically a pretty powerful... Um, a pretty powerful warrior that Nasus himself, like, you know, used to fight side by side with. So if if Nasus and Renekton had been sent elsewhere by Zareth before the Ascension so that they wouldn't interfere, it is reasonable to assume, like, whatever threat he made up that you have to go see, that he would have sent them with some powerful warriors. So... You know, if she was pregnant at the time or anything, like there, there were actually probably a lot of people that survived the incident, provided they weren't right there at the time. Yeah, I, I mean, I think you're. So I will say as to what specifically goes on in Bloodline, it's a little hard. I don't remember the exact all the exact text because it's a bit longer. Uh, I know that the weapon that Sivir wields, her her, they call it the Chalikar. I think that's how you pronounce it. And that's that was a, gosh, what was the warrior queen's name? way back in Aatrox lore. Sataka, I think? Sataka, that sounds right. Yes, that was her weapon, and she died at Akathia, I believe. So it's a very powerful legendary object. So that, that may have been what Nasus was talking about, was just that weapon belonging to someone that he, he fought with in the past, because he would have fought alongside Sataka. But That's I don't true. I don't sure. think he specifically says that she can wield it because she's her descendant. I think he does say that you can wield it because you're a Zeer's this- descendant. Yeah, they say the ascended bloodline. They don't. So they, that's that's something I guess I would point out is that when they talk about bloodlines and descendants, they they often say the phrase ascended bloodline and not like Azir's bloodline. It seems to be implied that it's Azir's, but the use of the word descendant makes me wonder. I guess if it could be, you know, if Nas has got freaky, if he had a kid, would that kid be a part of the ascended bloodline, quote unquote? <laughs> but yeah, I, I think more to your point, it's definitely the it's. It would be absolutely reasonable to expect that there are Shuriman's outside of the main, the capital city, and it could easily be a mistress. It could be a member of the harem. It could be a seer. You know, he, we we know that the family tours around the empire sometimes. Girl in every port. He's the emperor. You know who the fuck knows. <laughs> um, but instead of handling any of those ways, it's handled in a way that just it feels unnecessary. Like I said, I think it's just it's, this is a League of Legends lore, man. That's the biggest thing. I feel it feels so fucking bizarre that I have to be talking about this when talking about fucking League of Legends. It's just. I don't know. All right. Should we move on from the bio? <laughs> yeah, let's <laughs> well, I'll, everything else 40 minutes later. <laughs> I'll cover Arisen really quick since it's, it's just basically just bio. a bit of the bio. So yeah. Yeah. Azir at this point has been risen. Now, he didn't see what happened. He was in the middle of being ascended, and then he was dead-ish. Uh, so <laughs> he kind of missed the whole betrayal bit. So risen is basically just him walking through what used to be Shirima and kind of raising up the memories of what happened because it, it seems like the what happened in Shirima's, Shirima's final moments are kind of recorded in the sands here. So he kind of raises them up and replays what happened and that's when he sees that, oh shit, it was Zareth. Zareth did this to me. And I guess he immediately flips a switch. No further questions, Your Honor. I'm going to go get Zareth. <laughs> yeah. I saw it. I saw the video. Yeah. And that's it, right? There's, there's not much else in that story. It's very short. Yeah, I skimmed it because I was still mad about the bio. <laughs> sure. Yeah. So, and this was this was more tied to Bloodline and literally has nothing to do with Azir, but I saw a word in, in Bloodline that I was unfamiliar with, so I looked it up, but they mentioned Noxtura. Oh, I know what these are. Yes, I I had never heard that term before. Uh, So they are apparently gateways of dark stone. 
that are raised over roadways in areas that have been conquered by Noxus. Oh. So fun fact. Also means that that area yeah. has apparently been conquered by Noxus. <laughs> Neat. Yeah. Which I also didn't know. Yeah, I know Noxus has some, uh, I guess, holdings, colonies, whatever you want to say, on, on northern Shreeman shores. So there's some interaction there, I think. Yeah. I guess uh, talking about Arisen, there were a couple of things that I liked. I liked that he wakes up and he looks at the constellations and he notices that the, the constellations are, are misaligned. Um, I think that's a neat way to show a character like coming to grips with how much time's passed. It's a neat detail to kind of remember. It's. I yeah, mean, this is. I'm, I'm. I'm. I'm looking for little things. Uh, <laughs> apparently, ascended can't cry, which it mentions. It's like, oh, Azir wants to cry, but he can't because he's ascended. I wonder what else they okay. can't do. Okay. So I have a problem with this. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Cool. All right. Yeah, so here, here, let me let me see exactly how they phrased it before I before I get into this. Why can't they cry? Um. Maybe maybe uh, I'm reading it too literally. So maybe it's just an emotional well, thing. It said his ascended form rendered that simple act of grief forever lost to him. Um, so maybe it was actually just because he's a bird in his ascended form, and I don't think birds actually oh, have tear ducts. Interesting. Mm. That's okay. an interesting. In, in which case, I have less of a problem with it. I misunderstood. <laughs> sure. I I thought that they were saying that like being an ascended meant that he couldn't uh, feel that type of emotion anymore, which then immediately was followed by like with a heavy heart he watched, and I was like, wait, with a what? <laughs> I thought he couldn't. <laughs> but now it makes sense. I'm sorry. It's okay. Yeah, it just really for that was, one thing. Really was well written. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it's important to mention here that he still perceives that whole ascension thing as being stolen from like by him. Like, I mean, uh, he, he he's certainly a, a dick. I, I I think is is clear to say, and it, he's kind of perceived. Per, he's kind of personified as a dick here, but not to the degree that I think he actually is, or that the authors want us to think of him. Um, I think that's continues through here. It is interesting that he is still like, oh, he stole this from me. And at this point, I mean, maybe he hasn't had like the thousands of years to actually contemplate. It was just a thousand years of nothing. And now he's back. So he's still in the exactly the same headspace he was when he left. But um, that's true. He's still very much like, oh, this was stolen from me and not like, well, that wasn't for me anyway. I did kind of bully my priests into it in the first place. So maybe maybe it wasn't for anyone. <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm looking at my notes, and I there was a line here where I guess he's looking at Zareth's form uh, and, and seeing all the hate in Zareth's eyes. Like, where did such hate come from? It's like, where the fuck do you think it come from, you <laughs> thick fuck? Right? Like, he literally, Azir's not allowed to use Zareth's name in front of anyone, or Zareth will yeah. be killed. Like, he, what yes. do you... Uh, it does make complete sense for someone in, in Azir's position like no, no, I, to not that see, oblivious. I'm not I'm not justifying. I'm just yeah. saying if if you are like the people that we have in modern day society that would be comparable to Azir's position, they're not going to understand any of that shit. Should be like, "Oh yeah, people like me and like they're going to be surprised at any little thing they fucking find out." <laughs> they're protected in a nice cocoon of delusion. <laughs> that's that's true. I, I I think that's a fair point. I guess the issue that I have with with that a little bit is that He's had repeated arguments with Zareth about a very specific thing, and it's just bizarre that he wouldn't think, I bet it was that slavery thing. You know? Yeah, maybe like, because no. I forgot to TiVo the fucking Shreema bowl, but it's probably yeah. the slavery thing. <laughs> exactly. He understands that slavery is wrong. Like, he gets that. He understands. He doesn't like seeing his friend as a slave, and he understands that he's being mistreated. So I, I, I don't agree, John. I don't think that connection makes sense. I do I do understand what you're saying. But I also think Azir was also not treated super well his entire life because his family all fucking hated him for no reason that we understand. I don't know. I don't know. The whole thing's just unbelievably messy and makes no sense. Yeah. So moving yeah. on to I water agree. and shade. <laughs> okay, that's, yeah, let's, let's go to this one. This is an interesting one. So this is the one that's from Realms of Runeterra. And we have the synopsis of it. So this story is about um, this young girl from, I don't know exactly how to pronounce this. I'm going to say Sakal. Sounds fine. Sakal, maybe. <laughs> uh, basically, it's it's the town where Zareth was born. So this girl named Kari is collecting water and comes across Azir while collecting water. They talk for a while, and he basically unloads on her, like, <laughs> basically tells him his entire past, just like, hey, random girl I've never met before, let me tell you about the history of me. <laughs> so after he finishes telling the entire story, she's like, 
man, I really feel bad for Zareth. It sounds like he really, <laughs> really yeah. got the bum end of this. Just how I felt after uh, the story. That is not what Azir wanted to hear. Uh, Azir gets super mad, and he admits that he actually came to Saikal to destroy Zareth, his legacy, and the town where he came from so that no one would ever remember his name, ever. Yeah, strike so, him from history. Yeah. So bye, little girl. Yeah, so he <laughs> sets off with his sand soldiers to do so. Yeah, Kari's like, oh no, but my whole family lives there. So she throws a bowl at him to distract him, and he turns around, and it's kind of like, it is kind of implied that he turns around with the intention of like, all right, my sand soldiers are just going to fucking murder this girl then. Uh, and then Kari reminds him that he only achieved his ascension because of the kindness that he showed to Sivir and not to throw away that gift, making the same mistakes of the past. So he's like, yeah, you right, and turns around. <laughs> He fixes the bowl, supposedly. Oh, yeah, he sand. fixes the bowl, ah, which she broke. <laughs> very important part of his redemption arc that you missed there. Yeah, yeah. That, was his, that was his save the cat moment, I guess. <laughs> he fixed the bowl. <laughs> that makes up for all those years of slavery. It's hard It's hard to comment on this because I don't have the text. My best, if I, okay, so I would. I guess we should also, we've not mentioned the authors of, of some of these, but Graham oh. McNeil has written almost all of this, I would say. Not the bio and not the... Arisen was by Anthony Reynolds Linnae, who I know did like some Nasus work and was probably one of the writers for the Shrema thing. Um, but like Bloodline, Twilight of the Gods, this one, um, all written by Graham McNeil. Um, Bloodline also much better written, for the record. Yes, I like that one too. Yeah, all th I would say um, of the two that we can read, uh, Twilight of the Gods and um, Bloodline, those are both really well written. I would say, and I think those were really good, good reads, not really related to his ear. Yeah, we're gonna talk about them when we hit Nasus, I think, right? Yeah, yeah they're, they're way sense. more Nasus focused. If you're trying to get the Azir lore, you can completely skip those and you're not missing out on anything. Except for some cool stories. I, I still give them the <laughs> thumbs up. I recommend them, but not yeah. for Azir. Yeah. Um, but my best guess would be, without having the text in front of us, that maybe this is an attempt to just try and... We'll try and patch up Azir as much as we can. And let's try and fix some of this. But who knows? You know? Rewrite his bio. Fix it that Right, way. literally just delete a single, like, it's, you know. I could do yeah. it in a day. <laughs> I was going to say, should we talk about the cinematics, I suppose? The Descent into the Tomb, Rise of the Arisen, or was there something else you wanted to? Sure, yeah. I think those are those are probably the most, the most relevant. I think other than that, I've just got, like, uh, one quote that I wanted to talk about from his in-game quotes, and then he's got oh, yeah. one AU. Ooh, I don't know which one what it is, so I'm ex I'm excited to to know to it's learn. It's basically fake, but <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> Do we want to even summarize the videos? They're they're pretty short. They just it's mostly about Sivir. There's very little that's related to his ear, um, except for yes. him coming back to life. Exactly. So yeah, I'll, I'll summarize it real quick. So this this follows Sivir and Cassiopeia as they are going inside of Azir's kind of, or not Azir, uh, they're going inside the tomb where Renekton and Zareth are being held, where they've been kind of trapped underground. And they have their own, uh, what's it called? Like they've got their own party of people because there's a ton of traps here. It's kind of said that basically everyone <laughs> that has that is with them has died in the various traps in this area until it's just Cassiopeia and Sivir. And then they get down there, they find that the key to the tomb is actually Sivir's weapon. Oh. So instead of asking her for it, Cassiopeia just fucking stabs her from behind and takes it and opens the tomb. Which Weren't they going to open the tomb anyway? Yeah. I'm kind of okay with this. Yeah, I'm kind of okay with this because I, I saw this complaint in the YouTube comments and I'm kind of okay with it if Cassiopeia's perspective is, okay, I've got what I need. I'll kill her so, I'm, so she won't take mm. anything that's in here. I don't know what Cassiopeia expected to be in there. I'm kind of okay with it. You're, you're just the rewards, you know? <laughs> I'll tell you what she didn't expect to be in there. 
a curse that turned her into a snake person. (laughs) So she opens the door, a giant serpent statue type thing bites her, curses her to be snake person. And then on the tail end of that, Renekton and Zareth just fucking pop out of there and now they're free. And they leave poor Sivir bleeding to death (laughs) and to drag herself away. Luckily for her, her royal lineage blood falls upon the resting place of Azir, which revives him using lineage magic. We get to see his little ascension. Yeah. His, his little ascension. Yeah, he gets little wingies. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I wanted to talk about these a little because as, as beautiful as they are, I really like the visual style on these. They're Very really cool looking. I really fucking hate the narration and the voiceover for these videos. I, I will sometimes go back and just watch through League cinematic, Cinematics, and I always skip these because I <laughs> fucking hate the writing. It's so... Sivir was stunned. or like the, the like. I, I, there's a million examples that you can go listen to. It's just bizarre. Um, now, John, I have a question for you. Did Ooh. you ever see the cinematic with the original narration and voiceover? It was not NASA's. I remember I I did watch them when they first got released to the client, um, but I I don't remember what the original one sounded like. Who was it? The original one was very different because it was not from a third party. NAS is just kind of telling you what's happening. It was actually back and forth uh, dialogue between um, Sivir and Cassiopeia. So you would have lines with where they were saying things in character as to what was happening on the screen, and it, it I I don't obviously uh, I can't find any shred of it. I don't better. think it ever. It was way better, and I, I remember seeing that before it got released. I was like, this is fucking dope, and I see it now, and it's like, man, I don't know what happened, but something got changed right before it hit production or something. I don't know. Oh, was that like an internal... Uh... Some, someone, I think they just made a decision, a creative decision, and I just I think they made the, the wrong one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, generally, if you want to put a voiceover to something like that, it's not going to improve it. Like, I can see that Sivir's stunned. You don't have to tell me. I think it's even beyond that. I think it's that the writing is so just straightforward, Sivir stunned, instead of at least something like Sivir's you know, heart, you know, race. That's not a good example for stunned. You know, your jaw drops. Something that, yeah. that is more <laughs> telling, not or showing, not telling. <laughs> that's the, the yeah, I was going to say, in the writing world, Mark, we call that <laughs> show, don't yeah. tell. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And and so it's it always pains me when I have to listen to it. Um <laughs> Just to pile on more on his ear. But it is very pretty. <laughs> yes, it's very Fuck pretty. Azir. Mute it. Yeah, yeah, I, I don't, I'm not mad. The, there's a few things about Azir in Bloodline that I guess would be good to pull out just so we know what's going on with Shirima kind of currently is that there's a lot of rumors about his city coming back. People are starting to migrate there. Um, we see that people are raising up fake Azir, like they, they're raising up fake sun disks discs which was pretty cool like fake ones of brass and shit and people are dressing like Azir and pretending to be his descendants and all that jazz um, and both Nasus and Zareth are on the hunt for uh, Azir's bloodline so essentially Sivir um, but that's kind of the state of Shirima as soon as he's come back it's just some important cultural things to mm. touch on and I guess it's yes. also worth mentioning that when <clears throat> Talia kind of enters the city since she has a pretty deep connection to like rocks um, and she kind of touches the rocks of the city and feels the pain of all of the people that died on those grounds all that time ago. So it's it's also kind of implied that like those consciousness, those consciousnessnessnessness. Mm-hmm. You got it. Yeah, got it. Got it in one. Uh, are still kind of there, um, and that's also kind of mirrored in as you're being able to rise them all up to see the last minutes, but like. They're they're still kind of mm. it's, it's kind of a creepy uh, ghost town, <laughs> like yeah. I guess literal ghost town. Mm. Yeah, it, it is a little creepy. Where because she's just talking about how there's soldiers who you can't really see their faces, and they're all sand soldiers, but they look kind of like people. And like you said, she touches one of the buildings and it's like, oh fuck, that's not good. Um, I'll be curious to read more Talia. When see, we that's get to way her. more interesting. Yeah, she seems to be kind of the main character of this region. That also ties to one interesting quote of mm. Azir's that seemed confusing to me what is the desert but the ashes of my enemies no it's my dude those are the ashes of your people (laughs) that's all your people (laughs) yeah that's a fair point 
you know, it sounded better in his head, and then he said it, and he's like, ah, that doesn't make sense. <laughs> it's fine. It's intimidating. All right, John, do you want to take us down to your neck rit hole? Oh, oh yeah. So, sorry, oh, I phrased yeah. it like that, neck rit, if you listen. So, <laughs> yeah, so, so there's an interesting, He, I mean, he released this video on April Fool's, so the first kind of half of the video is like, what I would consider like, oh yeah, this is legit interesting thought experiment. And the second half just gets wild, Mm. but I'll focus on the first half. (laughs) It was basically called like, what would have happened if the Zier hadn't have died? Because I think Mm. this is actually, this sun disc exploding, Shirima being blown up basically. This is a huge, huge pivotal moment in Runeterran history because it sets off a lot of things into motion that become massive events within Runeterra. It, so one thing, if Shreemakaiden hadn't, hadn't have imploded the, and the ascension had actually worked even, or even if it hadn't worked, even if Azir was just kind of there as emperor, mm-hmm. then the ascended would have had a follower and it's kind of implied that they would not then or have... a leader? Yeah, they would have had a leader... And they would not have essentially been aimless and started fighting amongst themselves, which would have prevented the Darken War entirely. Because it is kind of said in the lore that, like, when without somebody to lead them, they became aimless and began infighting and thus began the Darken War. So if he hadn't have died, it's kind of implied that the Darken War just wouldn't have happened. (laughs) And if the Darken War hadn't have happened, that would mean that there would not be people vying for control over the world stones in order to defeat the Darken, which likely would mean that the rune war wouldn't have happened. Okay, so that's how the world runes tie in, because I I was aware of them in the rune wars, but that was very explicitly to to stop the Darken then? Yeah, I mean, they were, people were fighting over them before the Darken, just kind of um, vying for regional power, because they were really powerful. powerful, Um, But they were kind of yeah they what i think caused a lot of the the big big bad stuff was trying to harness that power to defeat the the darken it's kind of a i think said somewhere that the ascended two were originally from the celestials as a countermeasure to kind of the the void almost so that they could fight against the the powers of the void now if shirima if shirima had not have been destroyed and the Ascended had not turned half into Darken, lent credence to the fact that, like, yeah, raising Ascended is a great way to fight the the Void. Like, let's just fucking keep doing that. Like, the Sun Disk would have still been there. They probably would have raised more Ascended, which would probably also mean that since it's also clear that the that Shirima is very, very expansionist, like, their, their goal is to just expand over everything, that they probably would have taken over, like, a good deal of the world with the ascended at their back to kind of control that and if if we were to kind of take that as fact that (laughs) i like this this is really neat (laughs) it it could also be said that if they were if they were able to expand far enough into rune terra then it's very likely that kind of smaller local kingdoms wouldn't have been able to expand to have like their own leadership like azir would have been the emperor you could have had like local town leadership but you wouldn't have had kings such as the ruined king Hmm. he would have never come to power he would have which would have kind of prevented the entire arc of him releasing the black mist onto the world ruination is that what we're calling it yeah, the ruination. So there's a lot of uh, a lot of maybes. There's a lot of maybes in here, happened. but but it is <laughs> it is definitely a this this was kind of a a pivotal point in the in the entire kind of history of of how Rune Terra ended so, up falling to the state it's at today. But was the idea that Azir would be leading the Ascended, even if he wasn't Ascended? I mean, he was already leading the Ascended. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I don't, uh, yeah, I don't know. I I think that maybe they still would have become darkened without that. I also don't buy that everyone would have just like rolled over and let Sharima take over. I feel like that would have led to its own wars. You know what I mean? Its own conflicts. Is <laughs> I mean, I sure. don't think they would have rolled over either. But I think yeah. it's it's especially in the short story that we had read for I think the Atrox one. Um, it kind of shows how like oh, 
we had we were up against a handful of ascended and yeah we had armies they had armies but then when the ascended took the battlefield it was just fucking all bets Slaughter. were off and then we had to raise yeah. the void or <laughs> or we were all dead like it's kind of that there is no defense against the ascended it seems which is why i mean they had to turn to the the world runes anyway which sure i guess did the trick but then almost yeah. destroyed rune terror to do it it's true but again, that's all, all kind of like all hypothetical theory from, yeah. from Necrit, but I, I liked it a lot. <laughs> well, I really like the thought experiment. It's really scratching the like history part of my brain that I really like when I read <laughs> history, where you can see how I think it's it's really important thing that you called out that it's a really pivotal it's a really pivotal event, um, and it's easy to kind of lose track of that when you see well this causes this and this causes this, and that's how we find ourselves in the state that we're in today uh, in Rune Terra, obviously, and it's really neat to look at it in that way. Uh, I will say, Rebecca, I do agree with you that I think the Darken were kind of a, uh, they're kind of always, they were always destined to end up being that way because looking at that Twilight of the Gods story again, where we see at least eight, I want to say, ascended, maybe more, um, who have talk, come together and they're, they're kind of meeting and discussing the current state of things as they're already embroiled in massive conflict. Um, but it seems to be the case that just being an ascended kind of fucks you up. And it, because the, a lot of the, the idea is that you're just a, you're just a mortal, and you're just in, in, in at your very core, you're still just a person. But now you're living across eons, and you lose track of. It's like being a vampire, kind of, where you kind of don't you don't give a shit about human life. You don't even notice when your servant dies and a new one comes up, because who gives a fuck? You're immortal. You know your body doesn't. Even though their bodies regenerate, their bodies don't always heal fully. Their minds are kind of going. They've got a couple. There's like a pair of like Raven twin ascended who are completely insane utterly and it, it just kind of points to the, the to it being an imperfect thing that will always kind of come crashing down now how i it, it would still be really interesting to see you know maybe there would have been a dark and war but something that was much more um organized and maybe you would end up with a subset of people who like nasa's who can kind of keep their shit together but it's a really neat thought experiment to look at i'm curious to kind of <laughs> start thinking about that from all these other big world changing things that we're starting to, starting to gather up, you know? Like how does that interact with the with like the void and uh, the watchers, for example, if you've got a bunch of ascended who are ready to go and have like fought the void for eons and they're just fuck that howling abyss, man. So. <laughs> we're going in. Yeah. So does anyone have any uh, any final thoughts on Azir before I move on to the very extensive AU? Uh, I think we've I've captured most of my my feelings about him. I was just going to say, I did like that he has quotes about attacking Vile Maw from Twisted Tree Line. So, you know. I actually had a note about that, too. I was, I was like, is he the only one that has Vile Maw specific quotes? Because I don't think <laughs> I'd ever time. seen that. <laughs> oh, oh, and also speaking of old things, uh, if you watch those, if you go and watch those two videos we talked about, the Descent into the Tomb and the other one, at the very end, you know, after the video, it will play like the little in video, video like PIP links. And one of them is the uh, go play the new ascended gameplay on on Crystal Scar. Rip, <laughs> right? <laughs> oh, too oh, good, man. Yeah, that's all. That that's that's just a little funny thing I I, I noted. I mean, one one Azir does show up in the Academy uh, comics. Everyone apparently sure, shows sure. up in the Academy. But comics. to be fair, this was specifically he only showed up because I think it was it was an. Ex- it was a uh, a mistake of echoes, and they ended up going back in time and bringing dinosaurs back from a uh, <laughs> a museum that they were visiting, and his ear was amongst them. Uh, I cannot wait to get to echoes. <laughs> but uh, he is also in the Giants universe. <laughs> I mean, true is like true damage Giants. Uh yeah, yeah. The true damage universe. Uh, there is a <laughs> coffee shop called. Barista Sharima that has a picture of Azir on it, so he apparently owns his own uh, his own line of coffee shops. He's literally a universe. coffee shop AU. <laughs> wow, that is a hell of a fucking catch right there, man. <laughs> I would like Azir much better as a barista. Yeah, I actually had to turn up the resolution of <laughs> the video to 4,000 <laughs> because 1,800, I could not read the signs. Wow. That's dedication right there. <laughs> yeah. All right, are we done with Azir? I'm very done with Azir. 
Right, I'm 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 ready to wash my hands, Vizier. And the A's. Yes. Oh yeah. Go yay. Done with A's. Finally. Yay. <laughs> Finally finished the A's. Uh Whew. finishing it off with his ear. Yeah, so that's going to do it for uh, this episode. Thank you for listening. We haven't really done this before, but if you like the show, if you could, like, review it on iTunes, that'd be pretty cool. Or, like, tweet it out or something. I don't know. Yeah, tell us all the shit we got wrong. Yeah, no, no. I was going to say, (laughs) if you hate it and you have feedback, let us know. (laughs) Yeah. All right, and uh, join us next week when we get to talk about the wandering caretaker, Bard. 